Welcome into the house of the Lord. What a beautiful Sunday morning. For those of you that have just moved here, I understand, welcome to the Big Island. For those of you visiting for the first time, we also welcome you. Uh, we're going to be entering into a time of worship. But before then, I just wanted to share something really quick. Um, my wife and I, we like to watch the news in the morning just to kind of find out what the weather's doing. So we know what kind of day is ahead, if it's going to be really wet or it's going to be a sunny day. But most of the time, they have little blurbs in the morning that talk about the economy or small businesses that are shutting down. So for the past couple of weeks, there's been news reports of uh, businesses that are three or four or five or greater generations that have shut down. And in one in particular this morning that we listened to, it was a daughter who was planning to take over the business from her father. It was a bakery. But she couldn't do it, not because she didn't have the wherewithal, but because the other businesses that had supplied materials to her father's bakery were also going out of business. And it got me to think about what we do as parents and as community members when we witness or we share the gospel. Without a fresh sharing of the gospel, every opportunity we have, the gospel will not continue to be shared. So if we don't pour that into our children, into our neighbors, into our community and beyond, then we can't be surprised when there's no more of the gospel left to share and no one left to hold the torch to carry it forward. So I just thought that it was a unique segue into our uh, worship time and into our message today. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we love you so much, Lord. No matter where we're from, whether we're visiting, whether we live here, or we're born here, we've recently moved here, Lord, you know our every step and every hair on our head is numbered, Lord. And you care for us so deeply, Father. And even though things may change, Lord, your word says that you never change. That Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. And Father, we hang our hat on that, Lord. We trust in that. We trust in your word, Father. Because that's really all we have as followers of Jesus Christ, Lord, is your word. Father, as we enter into a time of worship, I pray, Lord, that you would quiet and still our hearts block out any distractions father or any thoughts that may hinder us from entering into a time of just quiet stillness father lord we are so truly 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 thankful for your love father and for all that you do for us lord we pray these things in jesus name Amen. 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 Yes. Can sit or stand, let's worship. We bow our hearts, we lift our hands, we turn our eyes to you again, and we serve. That all we need is found in you. Receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration, how wonderful you are. Upward call of God in Christ. You have our hearts, Lord, take our lives. Receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration. I want. Every 
every soul you save sings out everything you may resound all creation standing now lifting up your name we're joining in the angels song we gather to your ancient throne children in our father's arms shouting out your praise receive our wonderful we pray lord that you receive our adoration lord and our praises lord we thank you for saving each and every one of us lord we can never ever attain salvation without you we thank you lord in jesus name amen When the music fades And all is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all of it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth, no one how much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required Much deeper within to the waste of the fear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry.
It's all about you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where you should of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Go to walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing. darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Yes, Lord, you give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Giving you my heart and all that is within, I lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. I'm giving you my dreams, I'm laying down my rights, I'm giving up my pride for the promise of you, life. And I, I surrender all to you, all to you. Oh, I, I surrender all to you, all to you.
singing you this song I'm waiting at the cross And all the whole world holds dear I count it all as lost For the sake of knowing you The glory of your name To know the lasting joy Even sharing in your life eh? think about new life a life apart from this broken bodies thank you lord there's a place where mercy reigns and never dies There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide Where all the love I've ever found like a flood comes rolling down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in awe of you I'm in awe of you where you love ran red and my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless. Hallelujah. There's a place where, where my heart has peace with God. And forgiveness Where all the love I've ever found Comes like a flood Comes flowing down At the cross, at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all
Thank you, Lord. Let's honor our God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for such great love, Lord. A love that I, I can't even do today fathom because the life I live, man, was so... But it's all about you, Lord, and what you did for us. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for your words. So let us hear your words so we don't fall into folly all the time. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's greet one another.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. As you settle down quickly, a, a few announcements. You may have received one of these books. It's called More Than a Carpenter. Um, if you've never read it, read it. But I encourage you to pass it on to someone else that doesn't know the Lord. It deals with a lot of good questions about our faith. Inside, there's a little track, How to Get to Heaven from Hilo. So um, if somebody has never made that decision, it's available. Also, there's a special movie coming out, The Ark of Darkness. It's an incredible movie. I've seen previews of it. Um, I encourage you, if you get a chance, go and see it. The flyers are back there. Um, lots of times people don't know, I don't know how to share the faith. There's a few sheets on the table. It's called the Romans Road. And it really leads you through those verses, how to share with people. Those are free too. Also, you're so loved, the little gospel back there too. I encourage you to take advantage of those. People are more sensitive to the gospel this time of year. And so we need to take advantage and get that word out. If you have your Bibles, please open with me to the book of Ruth. Oh, one more announcement, too. Some of you asked about my eyes. I was going in for eye surgery last week. No, I didn't get my eye surgery. Um, there were some differences there, um, misunderstandings, and I just stopped. I put it on hold for now. Um, but when God deems the time, then I'll go back and try again. But let's open in prayer. Father, thank you today for your grace, abundant grace, your mercies that are new every morning. We look to you to speak to our hearts that we would understand your truth, understand your love that you have for us and for the lost. And Lord, you had this planned before the foundation of the world. Not an afterthought. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for demonstrating that love in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now this morning I'm going to do something different. We're going to look at, and I've done things like this, but this is still different. Four chapters this morning. Usually I do just a few handful of verses and deal with the topic. But the reason I'm doing this is, you know, I'll read a lot of comment. I'm not going to take you in the detail as deeply as I normally do. But the title of the message really is the ultimate kinsman redeemer. This is being that time of year we need to think about, and this is kind of preparation for where we're going to go. Jesus Christ is that ultimate kinsman redeemer. And this was planned before the foundation of the world. And there are some wonderful things in this book of Ruth. I encourage you to take the time and read it later. I'm going to go through it and read it. I'm going to comment here and there and lift out little things that might help you. But I'm going to end on the fact that Jesus is that ultimate kinsman redeemer. Now, the church, the body of Christ is split in, in, in a couple different ways. That is the orthodox, I'll take that group. They focus upon the, the, that Christ is risen, and they say the Protestants, that's us. We're not protesting anything. We focus upon the cross. But in reality, we focus upon what the Bible says. The Bible teaches us about the cross. He demonstrated his love when he went to the cross and died. There could be no, no resurrection without a death. And then we'll focus on the end. How does that apply to us? Are we living that resurrected life? So today we'll look at the kinsman redeemer. Next, way, uh, next week would be the way, uh, the way of the cross. And then we'll look at it then on, on Easter, the, the resurrection of Christ very quickly 
But I'm going to talk about the benefits of that resurrection and cross, how it affects your life, your attitude, and how we will live our life or should live our life to experience the fullness of joy that God has for every single one who trusts in him. Amen. Well, the book of Ruth is one of two books in the Bible that really featuring women, particular women. It's considered a a woman's book, but I like it. It focuses again upon Ruth, we're going to see, and and some other women. But then there's the book of Esther. Esther was set apart. God is never mentioned in that book, but the hand of God is so evident in there, and she saved the Jewish people. Well, again, as oddly as this may be, when we talk about this woman, Ruth, she was a a Moabitess. She was from Moab. And the people were perpetual enemies of the Jewish people. But still more surprisingly, Ruth actually appears in in Matthew in the genealogy of the Christ, the, the genealogy of the king. How significant it is. Again, still more significant is is Boaz because he he is going to be this kinsman redeemer we're going to see in this story. Which is a shadow or picture of really Christ to come. There's some things that we'll see. And it's through that lineage taking us right to, again, David, King David. Again, the promise of the Messiah would come through him as well. We see that in the lineage. This is what makes this book so interesting when we stop and think about it. Now, Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. It's the picture I've already kind of mentioned of the Lord Jesus Christ who paid the price you and I could never pay. There needed to be a sacrifice. A kinsman redeemer had to be someone that was very closely related, the closest related in most cases. This is why... God had to become a man. God had to become flesh. He was fully God and fully man. He had to be a man so he could be that kinsman redeemer. This is a shadow. This is a picture. I'm only laying out on the surface these, just these golden nuggets for you to go back and read and think about and, and pray, and God will just reveal all kinds of wonderful things. The kinsman redeemer in the Old Testament would redeem property uh, as well as a life, whatever. God has made that provision. It was a shadow right from the very beginning. So a kinsman would redeem and vindicate a a relative. And we are a close relative to Jesus because he became a man in his humanity. He vindicates us by his blood. You and I are cloaked by the blood of the Lamb. That the Father sees us in Christ Jesus, spotless. I don't think any of us here are really spotless. But that is the finished work that he will do in our lives. Isn't that a wonderful thought? That one day, you'll never hurt anybody with these lips, never be under misunderstood, you never sin against a holy God because he's doing the work in the life of every person who puts themselves under him. And this is important to understand. Well, got your running shoes on? We're going to fly today faster than normal. Chapter 1, it begins with a famine. This is Ruth 1. Notice what it says. Now, it came about in the days of Judges, When the judges governed that there was a famine in the land, a certain man of Bethlehem of Judea went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. The name of the two sons were Maon and Kilian. They were Ephorites. They're from Bethlehem of Judah. And now they entered this land of Moab and they remained there. Now, if you were in Israel and you were standing on, uh, you know, Bethlehem, it's about six miles from Jerusalem, and you could actually literally look across that Jordan Rift and you would see that land of Moab. 
And what's significant, you could see the rains just stopping. And you could, you could see, again, the wonders of this. But see, in, in Israel, it was dry. It was a famine. God had promised blessing upon them, early rains and late rains, if you just be obedient. But it was the time of judges. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Isn't that what we see in the world today? It's like we're coming back again. And that's what happened in the book of Judges. It, it would go back and forth, back and forth. It, it, they, they would be suffering. God would deal with them and, and they'd cry out and God would rescue them and, and they would just kind of like a dog returning to its mom and go back. Well, it looked greener the other side of the hill. Does it ever look greener the other side of the hill? Well, if I just move over here, everything's going to be wonderful. Everything's going to change. Could be a job. It could be a little physical move. Sadly, I've heard people say this, well, if I just get rid of my wife, I have a better wife, or get rid of the husband, and greener the other side. We, we come up, we're full of excuses. Would you agree with that? We're very good at that. Well, there's something else I want to call your attention to. It, it's the setting of Judges, as I just mentioned. It was a time that Israel was backsliding, and God disciplines those that he loves. This is the purpose for the famine. He wanted to, to bring them back to him, but, but many were running from him. So the story of Ruth reveals how God, and this is important to understand, divinely intervened in the nation of Israel. Divinely. He's not off sawing logs. He is active in our life even today, working in our life through the circumstances that may seem, oh, this is terrible. But God will use it for good. He assures us that, doesn't he? Yes. Do you believe his word? Yes. Now, I don't like the circumstances I'm in sometimes. I don't think you do either. We don't have to like the circumstances. We can like the fact that God is in control. Well, see, God is divinely intervening in order to accomplish his plan of redemption, buying back. And this is important to understand. Both Israel... And the world. Ruth was a Gentile, an example of what God was going to do in the future, that the Gentiles would come into the church. Normally, this, the Jewish people would read this during the Feast of Weeks. Okay, and we're doing it because we're going in because what we're going to focus upon, the death and the resurrection. Well, they didn't see this big picture at this time. The book opens with, a, again, to meet a Jewish family. That's, that has left this place. Oh, left what place? Notice Bethlehem, the house of bread. Of Judah, which is the place of praise. So they left the house of bread, the place of praise, for Moab, which is like in the Psalms, a dish pot, dirty water, enemies. They moved among it. And see, Elimelech, his Name means, my God is king. And Naomi means, my pleasant one. Now, to the Jewish people, this meant a lot. But we see that it's really easy to say, I'm a Christian, and not be a Christian. Just as easy it is to say, Elimelech, my God is king. It's so easy. We can say all kinds of things, and and really live a hypocritical lifestyle. And this is what Elimelech did. And he leads his family to a place he never should have led them. It brings death, you're going to see in a moment, to himself, his two sons, and leaving his wife bitter. It would have been better to stay in the land and trust God. You know the scripture, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. He'll make your paths straight, right? But sometimes we just don't do that. Again, look with me. We see the funerals in verses 3 through 5. And then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. She was left with two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. And the name of one was Oprah. Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm human, aren't I? <laughs> and the name of the other is Ruth. And they lived there 10 years. And then both Malon and Killian also died. 
And the woman was bereaved, and her two children and her husband. It's in verse 6, we begin through 15, we see the farewells. Then she arose, Naomi that is, and her daughter and her daughters-in-law, that she might return to the land of Moab. Notice why. For she had heard that the land of Moab, that the Lord had visited his people and giving them food. See, those that are in caravans would go through and, and they were telling, man, God's blessed them. God had disciplined them. Oh, I know there were still problems, just as there are problems in your life and my life. God's going to finish those in our life, isn't he? And we're thankful for that. In verse 7, it says, She departed from that place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah, that place of praise. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go and return of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and me. May the Lord grant to you and may find rest each in the house of your husband. Then she kissed him. She lifted up their voices and they wept. They sobbed. Actually, the word means more sobbed. They, there was this relationship. And you know how a relationship can be in your family, but they're sobbing. They don't want to leave. They come to know the love and feel safe in the love of the other. In verse 11, but Naomi said, return my daughters. Why, why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that you may have husbands and return my daughters? Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said that I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they're growing? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than you for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Verse 14. And they lifted up their voices, they wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth clung to her. And then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her, notice, gods, and return after your sister-in-law. So this is, again, the, the death has occurred, and, and they're now moving back. And again, Naomi's concerned because, again, the kinsman redeemer or, you know, there was this right that if she had sons, she had to give her other son to them. It was the custom, the tradition, and I don't have time to go through this today. You can, if you want to know more, email me and I'll, I'll give you all the details you want later on. But she, she's sending them back. But the thing that I want to talk about is, is one daughter goes back. She says, oh, in her heart, probably she's looking dark. Yeah, I can't wait for a, a husband. I got to have it now. And she goes back. But, but here Ruth clung, clung to Naomi. There was a relationship. And we're going to understand the depth of her heart in a moment. And the words she said are some of the most incredible words that you have ever heard in the Bible next to that actually on Jesus Christ. Look with me in verse 16. We see her faith and the determination. Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me or worse if anything of, but death parts you and me. Determination, commitment. Sometimes this is what lacks in the, the body of Christ. It lacks in marriages. It lacks in our society a commitment to anything. Determination. Oh, we do have a determination, don't we? We do. Let me explain that. Whatever is really important to you, you do it. Isn't it true? We just sometimes have our priorities mixed up, all of us. I'm still learning to get the right priorities as I go through life myself. But here she has her priorities right. Verse 18, it says, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. She was determined to go. She was committed. This is one of the most noble utterances that you're going to find 
by any Gentile in the Old Testament. She was making a total commitment to go with Naomi. Where was she going to go? Naomi's destination. To dwell again. Wherever her dwelling is. Her people. Her God. She becomes a believer. That's why she's in the genealogy. Even her burial place. Look with me, verses 19 through 22. There's a frustration. In verse 19, it begins this way, that they both went until they came to Bethlehem, and when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. It means bitterness. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. See, she felt that all that she went through following her husband, God was dealing with her. Oh, I'm sure God dealt with her. But if she was a woman, a virtuous woman, a good woman, she would follow her husband. And it doesn't mean that, that, that she is reaping the decision of that family. And man, I'm speaking to you now that you need to be the godly leaders in that family. When I got saved, that was the thing. I wasn't that godly leader. We weren't even going to church. My son got baptized before I even came to the Lord, and I knew that I was wrong, and I needed to be that godly leader. Now, you're not responsible for their decisions, but you are responsible to be that godly leader in that home, to lead them in the spiritual things. But she feels, again, that... that it's the Lord's dealing with her. And so this is why she remarks the way she does. Again, verse 21, and I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? She feels that she is being disciplined by the Lord. And, verse 22, so Naomi returned with Ruth, the Moabitess, and the daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning, notice of the barley harvest. Okay, and this kind of gives us some date, but perhaps she was, had something to do with the decision maybe to go to Moab. It's possible, maybe she would say, hey, did you see it's greener on the other side of the hill, and kind of coaching her husband to, to make the decision leave. We don't know for sure. But what we do know is when she returns to the Lord, God blesses her richly. And that's true of a, of a backslider. See, again, everyone was doing what's right in their own eyes. That's, that's a picture of a backslider. And when a backslider returns back to the Lord, the Lord is looking like the story of the prodigal son with open arms and wanting to, to bless you and provide for you spiritually in every way. Look with me in chapter 2. Am I moving fast enough today? Okay. <laughs> Ruth's reaping we see next in the first, in chapter 2. And it, it begins with this mission of Ruth, and I love it. Naomi had a, a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth, of the, the family of Elimelech, whose name is Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, please let me go into the field and glean from the ears of the grain after one whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, go my daughter. One, Ruth, is she, she sees the need. She sees what's happening, the gleaning. She understands that she's a Moabite. She shouldn't be partaking of anything from them. She's an outsider in every way. But, but she's looking again. Look with me again in verse 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Please let me go into the field and glean from the ears after one whose sight I may find. I'm going to add the word instead of favor, grace. Have you ever looked for the grace of God? Keep yourself in the love of God and you'll experience that grace of God. 
That's so important. She's, she's looking to find favor. She's, she's walking in a sense that straight and narrow path. She's doing practically what she knows she needs to do to provide for the family. And she's going to provide for Naomi. And Naomi thinks she's going to provide for her. And it works all together in the story. Look with me, the meeting of Boaz, because it's introducing Boaz as, again, this kinsman redeemer for someone close in the family. Again, verse 3, we see the circumstances. She departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to a portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who is the family of Elimelech. Now, this was not good luck of some kind. It wasn't a, a coincidence or quinky dig some people would use. No, this is God's divine plan. God was going to make provision for her. God had already planned this. God knew before the foundation where what was going to go on. And I know I scratch my head. That doesn't make sense, but it does because it's God. And if you could understand your God, he's not much a God. Only what he reveals to you and me can we really know. So this is a divine arrangement. And there's the old expression I use from time to time. God saves the best for those that save the decision for him. Just keep yourself in the love of God. Just keep yourself, your eyes upon him, looking for that favor, looking for his hand. She doesn't fully understand this at this moment. But little by little, they begin to, to see a little more about God's hand. Well, She's led to the field of Boaz, whose family was Elimelech. And again, this is important to understand. He was a wealthy relative of her dead father-in-law. Verse 4 continues. Now behold, Boaz came to Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. Sounds like a dofo come in it. He's always got the, the wonderful cheering voices and, and lifting up. This, this man, he just is, bless you. It's easy to say that, but both of them say it from their heart. Expecting God to bless. Again, verse 5, and then Boaz said to his servants who are in charge of the reapers, whose woman is this? So he's noticed her. And the servant in charge of the reapers, replied, she is the young Moabite woman who was returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. So people know that she's here. They recognize, call attention at first when they come in. in. Verse 7, and she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheep. She humbly comes, respectfully comes, doesn't demand. She has no rights to demand. She is so unworthy because she's not a Jew at this point. This was planned for the Jewish people. And it goes on, and thus she came and has remained in the morning until now, and she's been sitting in the house for a little while. This is hard work. In verse 12, it says this, May the Lord reward your work, your wages be full from the Lord and the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Do you realize she has come to put herself under the Lord? Under his wings, it speaks, again, as in the text, you see, as a sign of protection. I love Jesus' words, though. Come, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give rest for your souls. Come and learn from me. My yoke is easy. The burden is light. Perhaps she knew that before Jesus even spoke. She comes humbly. Leon Morris, I'm going to quote him. He says, in a due course, the prayer was answered through him who was uttered. He recognized the religious aspect of Ruth's change of country by saying that she had come to trust under, and I'm using this word, Yahweh's wings. Yahweh, the God of all creation, the covenant God. And the imagery is probably that this tiny bird struggling under the wings of a foster mother. It gives a vivid picture of trust and security. And have you come under the wings of the Lord protection? When going into Israel, Jesus, how I wanted to gather you, 
as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. See, when you come to the Lord, that's what you do. You, you come under the protection, under the security of the Lord. The Lord's calling people home each and every day. But they have a choice. Do they want to come under his wings? It's in, again, verse 8 through 13. Then Boaz said to Ruth, listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go and gleam in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay with my maids. Let your eyes be up on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. And when you are thirsty, go for the water jars and drink as the servants draw. Not only is this protection, he's already made protection that you stay with them. And I told the man they're not to touch you. And this is, yes, talking about something physical. Take advantage of you sexually. You're a Moabite. Remember, this is the book of Judges, the same period of time in the sense that every man did what's right in his own eyes. I am going to provide security for you, protection for you, provision. So Boaz acts as a provider because she's going to reap abundantly, you'll see in a moment, and he is her protector. Well, that's a picture of Jesus Christ. Isn't he our provider and our protector? Isn't he our, our good shepherd? Leads us in all truth. It's in verse 10. Let's continue. And then she fell on her face and bowing to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? Have you ever tried to figure out why did God choose me? I hope you don't think about why did he choose me, but, but your own self. You know what I mean? Why did he choose any one of us? Because he's God. He's a God of love. And he wants to work in your life, and he's wanting to work through your life. A foreigner is a outside. This is Jewish people. Uh, but there is, again, and Hosea talks about bringing back, you weren't my people, but you will be my people. And to bring, he wanted to bring the Gentiles into the fold. Verse 11, Boaz replied to her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. How you left your father, your mother, your land, your birth, and you came to a people you did not previously know. And may the Lord reward your work, your wages, be full in the Lord. And the God of Israel, under his wings, you've come to seek. And then she said, I have found favor in your sight. For you have comforted me indeed, have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I'm not like one of your maidservants. She, she still knew her difference, but you know what I, I like is she recognized the grace. She had found favor. She recognized the grace. upon. Have you recognized the grace of God upon your life? Man, we need to really stop and say, Lord, thank you. Your hand is on my life in this situation and that situation. And something I grumbled about, it, it didn't work. And you kept me back because if I would have done it, it would have been a disaster. Let me read from Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. That will be on the screen for you. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, and from your father's house to a land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. Now this is referring to Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob going down. And he says, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. First of all, the nation of Israel is to be a blessing. Second, and I will bless those who bless you, and those who curse you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's how the church came about. They, they were entrusted with the law. They were brought to us. The Messiah came through the nation of Israel. This is important to understand. Jesus was the kinsman redeemer, promised all the way back from Genesis 3.15 that he would come. And as she was blessing, again, Naomi, God in turn was blessing her. You know, if you bless Israel today, it could be as simple as a prayer, God will bless you. If you curse Israel, 
And I'm saying that partially because of what's happening there, but partially because of the text. There will be a curse upon you. The choice is yours. Well, verse 14, at mealtime Boaz said to her, come here that you may eat of the bread and dip the piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat down with the reapers and she was served roasted grain and she ate and was satisfied and had some left. Isn't that how God does? He blesses us and there's, there's always something left over, left over that we could share with others. He was so impressed with her. He invited her to, to eat, eat with his workers, to, to treat her as an equal. He instructed, again, the workers to take care and provide for her. It's in verses 15 to 17. We see some instruction. And when she rose to glean, Boaz commanded his servants, saying, Let her glean, even among the sheaves. Do not insult her. Also, you shall purposely pull out some grain from the bundles and leave it that she may glean. Do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and she beat it out, and she gleaned, and, and it was about an ephah of barley. Now, you know what we're doing now? We're gleaning from the scripture. Symbolically, because remember, this is a spiritual book. It has a spiritual picture. They're literal things, first of all, can have a spiritual picture. We need to glean from the word of God. Remember, Bethlehem means house of bread. Jesus claimed to be the bread of life. And once you begin to catch these symbolism, these pictures, it will just open up so many things. So notice at the end of the day, she beat out, she gleaned, she came up a very generous amount at that point. And we must do when we come into the Word to get, again, what we can get out of it. To look, and, and it's work to chase these symbolism down. But the Bible always reveals itself is not open for private interpretation. We're not to read in. So anything that I bring, it can go and chase back and you'll find it in the Scripture. That's the work. Now, some people have gone before us and can point these things out. We see in Boaz how he illustrates the, the excellence of Christ when you stop and think of He was a man of great wealth. He was compassionate to, uh, again, a stranger. Again, who had no claim of any favor, but he lavished her. He knew all about Ruth. He's all-knowing, isn't he? even before he met her. He served Ruth graciously, and all of her needs were satisfied right from the text we saw. He granted her protection and prosperity. And these acts of grace were foreshadowing really the ultimate redeemer that we're talking about today. The one that would go to the cross and die for every single person in this world, whether they would receive him or not. Look with me in verse 18, and she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned. And she also took it, from, took it out and gave it to Naomi, and what she had left, she was satisfied. Her mother-in-law then said to her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man whom I worked today was Boaz. Naomi recognizes that name right away. And she says in verse 20, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, The man is our relative. He is one of the closest. Notice, one of the closest. This is important to understand. And then Ruth, the Moabitess, said, Furthermore, he has said to me, You shall stay close to my servants until I finish the harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it's, it's good, my daughter, that you go out with his maid so that the others do not fall upon you in another field. So they stayed close by the maidens, or so she stayed close by the maidens 
of Boaz in order to glean until the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. So she had shown, he had shown her this uh, graciousness. The, the mother just, again, just exhorts her just to stay there, recognizes who this man probably knew the background about him. He was a wealthy man, remember, and she just is sort of, don't wonder, don't wonder from his field, knowing the consequences that she might suffer. How important it is for those to that give us wisdom to listen and obey. That rebellious nature, have you ever just, somebody kind of gives you some wisdom and you kind of bing, go over here and, and you suffer the consequences? Most of us have done those foolish things. See, Ruth recognizes the wisdom, recognizes, again, just Naomi's wisdom, and, and then as well as Boaz, the, the, the graciousness, the kindness, she found favor with them. Look with me in chapter 3. In verse 1, it, it, we see the plan. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you? that it may be well with you? Now is it not Boaz, our kinsman, with whose the maids were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. It shall be when he lies down that you notice the place where he lies, and you shall go and uncover, notice, his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what to do. And she said to her, all that you say, I will do. Now this is something to come, she is now going to, in a sense, uh, propose to him. It's not exactly the same way, but the idea is she's putting herself under his authority. She's asking him to be the kinsman redeemer. When you come to Christ, you recognize your unworthiness, your sinfulness, and you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you and come into your life and change you from the inside out. Well, she comes and she's, as you see, what we're going to do is go through here. See, Ruth, being a stranger, doesn't know any of these customs at all. So she has to be given detail by detail. This is what you do. This was something that was common because people would get in trouble and here this man's going to provide he's a, a close kinsman and they're asking to be redeemed verse 6 is actually the proposal if it's a proposal so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all her mother-in-law had commanded her and when Boaz had eaten and had drunk not mean drunk but had drunk his heart was merry and he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came secretly, notice, uncovered his feet and lay there. Laid at his feet. It, 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 it's humility, humbleness. There's nothing, again, that is evil about this, vulgar about it. It was just a way that this woman to put herself under, and it's up to him to make that decision. It's his responsibility, she thinks. Follow with me, though. Verse 8, it had happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and he bent forward and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, notice, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid for you are a close relative. She's now requesting him to, to become that kinsman redeemer. Everything is pure. It may seem irregular in our culture. But again, there's nothing suggestive about this because we're going to see that she is considered a virtuous woman. So it's nothing immoral. In fact, in Proverbs 31.10, and I'm just speaking about this virtuous woman, an excellent wife, who can find? For her worth is far above jewels. How wonderful. And she's going to be this wife just like that. It's in verse 10 again. Then he said, may you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown this last kindness to be better than the first by not going after younger men, whether poor or rich. 
Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do whatever you ask, for all the people in this city know that you notice, or a woman of excellence, or a virtuous woman in another translation. This is important to understand. It is, it's all pure. He, he again commended her on her loyalty, her kindness. They're better uh, in the end than the, in the first. It just keeps getting better. Verse 12, now it is true, I am a close relative. However, there's a relative closer than I am. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. So there's this closer relative. He, he wants to do it. He's an older man. What, what does she want to do with him? It was arranged marriage. Remember what I said? God saves the best for those that save the decision for him. Because through this lineage, the Messiah will come. Verse 14, it goes on. So she lay at the feet until morning and rose up before one could recognize another. And he, and he said, let it be. Let it not be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. So you, you see, these are a man and a woman of integrity. He doesn't want to bring disgrace upon her or her mother-in-law or even himself. And look at with me in verse 15. We see the provision. Again, he said, give me your cloak that is on you and hold it. And she held it and he measured out six measures of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law's house, she said, How did it go, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, This six measures of barley is gave, uh, he gave me, for he said, Do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. So Boaz simply takes the shaw, six, uh, again, ephahs of barley is, is given there. It's, it's, it's evidence of a deep love, love. It wasn't based upon emotion at that time. A love was a commitment. Oh, by the way, love, commitment, when you're married, it's a covenant relationship. It is a commitment. It's between the husband, the wife, and God. All three of those. It's till death do you part. Well, again... Verse 18, then she said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. For this man will not rest until he has settled it today. And he's going to act immediately. He's also determined. Look with me in chapter 4. We see Ruth receiving. Verse 1 of chapter 4 says, now Boaz went up to went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative whom Boaz spoke was passing by. And so he said, turn aside, my friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down, and then he said to the closest relative of Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to uh, brother Elimelech. So I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it before those who are sitting here today, before the elders of the people. If you redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. And then Boaz said to him, On the day you buy the field, see, she comes with the field, okay? <laughs> That's a story in itself. <laughs> On the day that you buy the field from the land of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name for the deceased inheritance. I like the way he arranges this. Here's the land. You can buy it. And Ruth's on the kind of the tail end of that. And... Verse 6, it continues, the closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would je jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it yourself if you may 
have the right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. Now, the word redeem, this is important to understand. It means set free by uh, a paying price, okay? In the case of Ruth and Naomi, Elimelech's property had either been sold or was under some kind of mortgage, and they, could, they had to redeem it back, okay? This explains why Ruth was also involved in the transaction, why she goes with the deal. And she was too poor, however, to redeem the land. She had nothing. And when it comes uh, to a spiritual redemption, again, you understand that we're all spiritually poor when we came to Christ. Spiritually bankrupt. Helpless. Could not save ourselves. And yet, we were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We'll talk more about that next week. But again, Jesus Christ gave his life as a ransom for sinners. And faith in him is, faith in him sets the captives free. We find real freedom in him. Now let me give you three verses in a row. Again, this is what a, a person that before you become a believer, and these are great verses to share, and they're part of that Romans road on that sheet that's over there. Romans 3.10 through 12, it says, as it's written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There's not even one. That was us before becoming a believer. And then in Romans 3.23, it says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Every single person in here, people say, don't tell me about sin. You're going to tell me I'm a sinner. Well, we're all sinned. It's just, that's why Jesus Christ had to go to the cross. That's why people don't understand it at Christmas. What has Jesus got to do with Christmas? They see the, the manger scene. He had to come to this world to pay the price you and I could not pay. Why? Because God is holy. And to be in his presence, we, we need to be cloaked with the holiness of God. But in Romans 6.23, here's the good news. For the wages of sin is death. What do you mean that's good news? Look at the last part, though. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The free gift. You cannot earn it. Certainly the scriptures already told us you cannot be good enough. All a person has to do is receive it, to acknowledge their brokenness and their need of a Savior and receive it freely. Look with me in, in verse 7 of chapter 4. Now this was the custom in former times in, the, in Israel concerning the redemption in exchange of a land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another and this was the matter of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. And he removed his sandal, and then Boaz said to the relatives and all the people, your witnesses today that I have bought this land from Naomi and all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and Malon. Well, verse 10, moreover, I have acquired Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, and to be my wife in order to raise up a name of the deceased in the inheritance. So that name of the deceased will not, notice, be cut off from his brothers and from the court and the birthplace. And you all are witnesses today. See, the one that was supposed to be closer, one who was just born as a human being, wouldn't take it because he would have to give up his own inheritance. The kinsman redeemer... You are his inheritance. You are Jesus Christ's inheritance. And I think, how could I be inheritance? I know my own heart. I know what he's doing. But you are so valuable that he gave his own life willingly for you and me. Now, not everyone could do, again, as I mentioned, the duties of kinsman redeemer begin with, he had to be a near kinsman. That's again why Jesus had to become a man. He came to his own, but they received him not. 
this is a major obstacle for Boaz because, again, he wasn't the closest. He went through the channels. He's willing to do whatever it took to make it work. When you see this as a, a type of Jesus Christ, that's what the Bible calls a type. Types are very, are very sim, uh, simple, like Noah's Ark. We all know Noah's Ark. You know, Noah's Ark had a door. And Jesus says, I am the door. And there's all these symbolism as you go through the Bible. And I'm not going to go through them because of the sake of time. But Jesus is a type. Or Boaz is a type. Okay? And he would become that kinsman redeemer. He became flesh and blood so he could die. Die on the cross for you and me. To pay the price that we couldn't pay. All of our sins would be imputed to him. Every sin, every, all your hidden sins as well. Your thoughts, all. He knows them all and he willingly went to the cross for you and me. When he was born into this world in human flesh, he became a near kinsman redeemer. He will remain a kinsman redeemer for all eternity. And if we would give a little phrase for this, what a matchless love. We talk about God being loved, but when you really think about this, this is all picturing his love for you and me. He died for you and me while we're in our worst. Now let me go on with this text and finish it real quick. And all the people who were in the court, the elders, said, we're witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming to you like Rachel and Leah and both whom the Built the house of Israel. May you achieve the wealth of Ephraim and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may the house be like the house of Perez and Tamar before Judah. And through the offspring of the Lord will give you the, this young woman. Verse 13, then Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive. Notice the hand of the Lord. And she gave birth to a son. Verse 14, we see the faithfulness of God. And the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today. May his name become famous in Israel. May he also be you a restorer of life, a sustainer in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. And then Naomi took the child and laid her in a lap and became a nurse. Then the uh, neighbor women came, uh, came or gave him the name again, saying, "A son has been born to Naomi," and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse and the father of David. In verse fourteen, or excuse me, eighteen. Now then, these are the generations of Perez, Perez. Hezron to Hezron, then Ram and Ram to Menadab, Menadab, Nashon and to Nashon, Salmon and Salmon to Boaz, and Boaz to Obed, and Obed was to Jesse, and Jesse to David. See, Jesus Christ is that ultimate kinsman, redeemer. The scriptures foreshadowing. So if you went to Matthew, not now, but Matthew, you will read. Again, the genealogy of this birth of the king, the kinsman redeemer that would come and die for you and me. But the question is, if you've never made a choice to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, now is the time to put yourself under his wings. He's available, willing, willing to save you. You know the greatest thing he needs to save me from? It's myself. Yep. Aren't we our worst enemy? But he'll save you. And when he saves you, he saves you to himself and you become his inheritance. Well, stand with me for the closing song. Father God, we thank you for meeting with us this morning. Thank you, Lord, that your word does not come back void. Oh, I move through it quickly. But Lord, there is much to glean in that book. Much to understand about your love for us. 
love for Israel, love for the Gentile, that we would be one in the church, neither Jew or Gentile. Simply a child of God. Lord, we're thankful that we can be a child of God. We're thankful for what you've done, but we're also thankful for what you are going to do. We look for your coming. Lord, we don't know when, but we want to be ready. Whether it's today, tomorrow, we fix our eyes upon you, the author, the finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.
that's really our desire, isn't it? Amen. For him to come, take us home to a world with no sin, no sorrow, and no pain. If there's anyone before you leave today that wants prayer, please come see us. I'm here. We want to pray for you. We want to encourage you. You want to ask about salvation. If you've never received the Lord, come see us. See Juan, see me, see Brian. We're here for you. And God bless you. Father, thank you today. Thank you that you have provided everything we need for life and godliness. You have given yourself. You've given all wisdom for those who call upon your name. That you will give us wisdom for every trial and every storm. You've given us faith to believe. And Lord, we just appropriate that faith and we put that faith in you, not in ourselves, but in what you have already done and what you are going to come again. We don't know when, but Lord, we want to be ready, looking for that moment in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, anyone wants prayer, please come see us. God bless you.